My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. If there's one crook that I'd like to speak to that has always remained silent, it's Russell Cox. Because Russell Cox is a sort of underworld version of a secret agent. Meet Russell Mad Dog Cox, a violent gunman, armed robber, prison escapologist, and Australia's most wanted man for 11 years. He escaped from Katingal in New South Wales in 1977. It was a jail that no one had escaped from. According to today's report, Russell Cox used half a hacksaw blade to escape. And he stayed on the run for 11 years. 11 years. And all that time, he was still doing stick-ups. He had his own alias. He loved the Phantom, so his alias was Mr Walker. And his dog, Butch, also had the alias The Devil, which was the Phantom's dog. Hello, Devil, old boy. How are you, huh? How are you? He used to get out early in the morning and go for a run. He was a master of disguises and actually franchise crime. He would get these big boxes and within it, he'd put all the plans, disguises and guns so other people could do the stick-ups. Police finally caught up with him in 1988 at the Doncaster shopping town when he was planning another job. After 11 years on the run, he was arrested. But when police caught him, they didn't know they'd hit the jackpot. It wasn't until a short time later that police realised just how notorious the two men were. The most infamous, Russell Mad Dog Cox, was for more than 10 years the most wanted man in Australia. According to standover man Mark Brandon Chopper Reed, it was a sense of injustice that set him off. Here's Chopper from the TV special on Cox called Tough Nuts. Russell Cox was the only peace freak yoga, um, yoga loving, peace freak, hippie gunman and bank robber, alleged killer I've ever met. Mark had great respect for Cox, although he said the most dangerous part of doing maximum security time with him was eating his overspiced vegetable curry. You know, the only thing he has out out of place is a touch of curry and and chilli pepper in the vegetables. Doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. He was into all this sort of touchy-feely, you know, um, save the world stuff, you know, you know. But he liked armed robberies and um, carrying guns. Russell Cox was a career crim, but he wasn't from a gangster family. Cox started his criminal career early. He won a raffle for a new bike when he was 10 years old. But because he wasn't there, they drew it again. He was so angry he stole a bike and told everyone that was the one from the raffle. Ken Ashworth was a detective with the Victorian Armed Robbery Squad. He was one of the team who finally caught Cox after 11 years on the run. As Cox was an escapee and a suspected murderer, he wasn't an armed robbery squad problem. That is, until he attempted the Doncaster heist. Then he came directly in contact with Kenny Ashworth. Ken spent years chasing the hard men of the underworld. And there was none harder than Cox. Recently, I went to have a chat with Ken, and he told me all about Cox. He is the luckiest crook walking around. His real name is Helmut Schmitzelis. Schmitzeling. Yeah. Yeah. He was a master of disguise and studied books on theatre makeup. Here's Ken describing what they found at Cox's lair. We found moustaches and wigs, uh, makeup, you know, anything, glasses of all sorts that he would use. It was clear he just disguised himself all the time. Cox absolutely hated having his photo taken. He would disappear whenever he saw a camera. There was, uh, he was a guest at um, McCurry's daughter's wedding and there's a famous photograph of uh, he ain't in that chair where <laughs> he was 30 seconds beforehand. Yeah, there's a wedding, sort of wedding party in the vacant chair. Russ, Russell saw the camera and he's gone. I'm out of here. Mm. But hang on, there was one photo um, that I remember of him at the armed robbery squad. 
<laughs> the infamous photo. Yeah. yeah. Arm robbery squad detectives were like big game hunters and they didn't get any bigger than Cox. They persuaded him to pose in a trophy photo, although I don't think he was given much of a choice. We used to take Polaroids back in the day and there's one of... Uh, it's like a footy shot where it's standing in the middle. And, something like that. And there he is. Yeah. When Cox was photographed with the armed robbery squad detectives, he doesn't look happy. He's looking down at a policeman's gun. Just wondering, I suppose. Now, just as you mentioned that, it's just as well we did that shot because all the photographs of that day were stolen out of the police car from the, of the photographer. Yeah. So um, a lot of the crime scene ones from the shootout were gone. They might, they might have been a good thing. Yeah. Well, again, how lucky was Cox? Yeah. That's what he gets, you know. Cox was a fitness freak who ran 15 kilometres a day, often before dawn. It wasn't just a health choice. His fitness helped him escape from Katingo. According to today's report, Russell Cox used half a hacksaw blade to escape, and authorities believe someone smuggled the blade to him while he was in the jail's observation ward receiving medical attention. When he was let into the exercise yard, he would pull himself up with one arm and cut through the bars with the other, using a saw. He then used some paint to cover over the cuts, hiding them until he was ready to go. Just on lock-up time, he said he'd forgotten his runners and slipped back into the exercise yard. He pulled the bars out, jumped out of the window, ran over two football fields and away. He had a sixth sense. Once when he was about to do an armed robbery in Queensland, he spotted a police dog. He walked through the target, saw an unmarked police car, jumped in and forced the police to drive him away. When he was pulled up at places like a breath testing station, he always managed to talk his way out. He was calm, but he could also be deadly. In another close call, this is how Cox evaded capture yet again. According to one witness, the detectives appeared to pull the man over for a traffic-related offence. Seconds later, he says the man produced a gun and forced the two detectives to lie on the ground. Cox then locked the police car and drove off. Today, several sightings, which later proved to be incorrect, had police speeding through the inner city suburbs. Some detectives conducted house-to-house -house searches, the handgun demonstrating how dangerous a man they believed Cox to be. The day Cox was arrested came out of the blue. Here, Ken gives us the inside story of the capture of Russell Cox. Talk us through the preamble to that. Sure, that was, uh, that was a big day at the office. I can attest to that one. I happened to be with a surveillance team out near uh, Doncaster on this, uh, this Friday afternoon when... Uh, Police were alerted about one o'clock by a telephone call reporting three people acting suspiciously outside the shopping centre. They got a call that people were acting suspiciously in a Queensland registered Holden Commodore. There'd been a series of similar stick-ups and several cars of armed robbery squad detectives just happened to be in the area. Cox's run of luck was about to run out. Ashy explains exactly what happened. So I took my surveillance team that I had with me straight to Doncaster. So we got into the shopping centre and we were able to find the car. So it was just parked amongst all the, the other rows of cars. So we set up a, a bit of an inner and outer perimeter um, and uh, secured the area as best we could. Nobody in the car at that stage. So one of the detectives from the squad got into the car. The tip-off about the car turned out to be the tip of the year for the police. Even though the car was empty, they found evidence it was being used by a man called Ray Denning. They were right on top of one of Australia's most wanted criminals. Denning and a fellow called Carrion were in that car. They had the car. So that's Ray Denning. He's another escapee, arm robber escapee. From, he just got out of New South Wales? He'd escaped. Raymond John Denning escaped from Goulburn Jail last week. Denning has spent half his life behind bars and was serving a life sentence for armed robbery and malicious wounding. So police knew this empty car belonged to prison escapee Ray Denning. Now, I'd taken the call from the Sydney hold-up squad uh, only the week beforehand, advising that he'd got out of prison, he was probably going to head our way. They did a hold-up on the way down. Um, they rolled a bag somewhere on the border. Unbelievably, Raymond John Denning, the escaped crim, left his prison library card in the car Turned out he was the one who was overdue. There was some paperwork, yep. Long Bay paperwork there. Yep, a, that's right. a library card or something yep. as silly as that. Yep, yep. With, with Ray Denning's name on it. Yep, yep. So yep. you knew it was him. Absolutely, yeah. They got out of the car as quickly as possible and set up a team of armed police to watch from a distance. 
they were ready to swoop when Denning came back. We sit around this, uh, this car, we watched uh, two people come back to the car and as we start to move in and shrink the perimeter around them, we see another car pull in a Ford right next to them and it's obvious that they know each other and the two will start talking. Police were covering the first car, but they weren't expecting a second. They had to change their plans on the run. We didn't know who this other fellow was, the sole occupant of this, of this Ford. So we're having a bit of a uh, re, uh, reassess of the plan. This is when the first car, the Holden, started to back out. As it turns out, the car turns left, we're running with it and we come straight in. Then police swoop, stopping the Commodore with one of their vehicles. No speed involved at all, it's like all walking pace. Um, I jump out of the passenger side of the police car as we slowly roll and just nudge bonnet to bonnet, jump up onto the bonnet of the car and cover the two in the front seat. And they had sawn off uh, 22s with them, bags and all sorts of things. So our man, Kenny Ashworth, grabs Ray Denning. But in the meantime, the second car, the mystery Ford, made a break for it. Once detectives stopped the Commodore, the suspect in the Fairmont sped off through the car park with about a dozen police in pursuit, firing as they went. The car squeals off to the left and then shoo, runs straight down the bottom of the, uh, the car park and then it's like Guy Fawkes night down the bottom end of the car park. And I look, look up and I could just see the roof of this other car. Um, so something's happened down there and shots have been fired. And I see the car comes roaring up towards us. The driver became desperate to get away and once again headed back towards the complex where he tried to run down a policeman who fired off several rounds from a large gauge pump action shotgun smashing the windscreen. I run foolishly right across in front of the car. Anyway, we blow the windscreen out and pepper the car um, and he ducks down and you can still see he was holding a revolver in his hand quite clearly because when these things are happening it's all seems like slow motion and you're very much alert to what's going on he clips uh, i think it was a red toyota which spins around and then he goes past us and smashes into a wall the car slammed into the wall of the underground car park and you see us then jump up into the seat with the impact the fair old impact so i ran up to the side of the car and i could still see him sitting there and he's still got the revolver in his hand so I let another round go out of the shotgun, which hits the door lock and then smashes through the console and I think gave him a bit of a scar on his uh, left buttock. Uh, and with that, he just sort of slumps down. And I run around covering him as other people come in and he's dragged out of the car. A policeman described the scene to TV reporters. He was found to be armed with a 38 revolver. The uh, occupant the, of the Commodore station wagon when removed from the vehicle. That vehicle was searched and three other firearms were found there. You've got him, you don't know who he is. What does he say when you arrest him? Um, you'll be surprised who you've got. Uh, he, he didn't sort of say anything until he got fingerprinted and then it was bang, yeah, you go, this is who I am. He's been on the loose since November 1977 and is the only man to have escaped from the now closed Katingle Maximum Security Section at Sydney's Long Bay Jail. Russell Cox, arm robber and legendary escapee, was finally caught. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And remember to rate and comment on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Unless, of course, you don't like it, then shut up. So Denning and Cox were arrested and interviewed by police over the next few days. Police hoped Cox might talk and implicate others in exchange for a softer sentence. But Cox was old school and stayed tight-lipped. Ken told me about his interview with Cox. We go out to... Um speak to Cox and uh, I remember walking, going to speak to him and uh, he sees me, just turns around and says, I've got nothing to say to them, I want to go back to my cell, that's it. So he was just the old school, that's it, wouldn't give you anything. Denning was a different story. To save his own skin, he sold Cox out. He told police that Cox was the mastermind behind one of the most disastrous stick-ups in Melbourne history, at Barclay Square. 
Barclay Square in Brunswick was the site of a terrible armed robbery gone wrong, all planned by Russell Cox, who was still on the run. It happened two weeks before Cox was caught at Doncaster. It was a stick-up that couldn't have gone worse. It ended up with a murder, a carjacking, a potential hit on a witness and a crim with a shot hand. Ken explained what happened. Now, I'll take you 11 days earlier. There was a armour guard chap murdered at, at um, Brunswick. Barclay Square, a fellow called Dominic Hefty. Uh, the armour guard truck was ambushed and uh, he was shot and killed in the exchange there. Police had a list of suspects who might have held up the armour guard truck at Barclay Square, which was packed full of cash. Cox wasn't on the list. It was Denning who told police that Cox was behind the Barclay Square job. If they'd known sooner, three people would be alive today. Cox has always had a team for the Barclay Square stick-up. Cox is the real offender. Cox and a bloke called Santo Mercuri. Santo Mercuri was a well-known hitman used by the Italian Mafia too, so he, he didn't worry about shooting anybody. He would do anything for a quid. He was a nasty piece of work. Santo Mercuri was the gunman. They had done a series of these and it was always on coals and it was always on an armour guard truck. They'd watch the guards go and pick up they would be in the store with wigs and disguises. As the guards picked up the cash, they would then surprise them and take the goods and run. This time, things didn't go according to plan. On this occasion, Dominic Hefty wouldn't surrender the cash tin. Dominic Hefty, the armour guard worker, refused to hand over the money. He was brave, but it didn't end well. In an exchange of bullets, both Dominic Hefty and Santa Mercuri were shot. Sando Mercuri's grabbed it and there's an exchange over and Sando Mercuri has shot him and Dominic Hefty shot Mercuri. At that time, Cox left, ran out of the store because it was all going too bad. Uh, Dominic Hefty subsequently later dies that afternoon at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, the injury was fatal from the, from the start. Nothing would have saved him. So Hefty was fatally injured and Cox got out of there. But his accomplice, Santo Mercuri, was still at Barclay Square, even though he'd been shot. Mercuri's shot in the hand. Mercuri flees out of the coal store dripping blood when he's shot in the hand. He then ambushes a lady in her car and carjacks her. We won't name the female driver for obvious reasons. Let's just call her Sue. He escapes and he leaves it around in Evans Street, Brunswick. Later, it's found later that night, blood in it and a wig. Neither Cox nor Mercuri were caught for this job. They weren't even on the police radar. The police had a different man in their sights, a man called Graham Jensen. Graham Jensen, a serious armed robber, was wrongly blamed for the stick-up and the murder of Dominic Hefty. Because Jensen and other people, they were committing hold-ups on armour guard trucks and, and we'd actually watched them case places out at um, Baronia and things like that. So they were very active um, robbers at that time. It made sense the police were looking for Jensen for Barclay Street, but he was innocent and the worst that could happen, happened. In his attempted arrest at Narry Warren, Graham Jensen was shot dead by police. 13 hours later, two police, Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre, was shot dead in an ambush killing in Walsh Street, South Yarra. It was direct retribution for the shooting of Graham Jensen. We'll look at the terrible Walsh Street killings in a later episode. So after the detectives caught Cox at Doncaster, they had to build a case against him. They wanted to charge him with Barclay Square, but they needed more evidence. They had to find Cox's hideout. It wasn't easy, but they found it. Cox was in prison, but Santo Mercuri, his Barclay Square accomplice, was still hiding out. By the time police discovered the location, Mercuri had fled, but there was plenty of evidence left at the house. But when we did find the address and search the address, we found uh, magazines for guns, uh, and we also found books that had uh, very basic coding of armour guard trucks, deliveries, times and things like that. Um, bits and pieces of other disguises and etc, etc. Ashworth and the team also found evidence of a murder Cox and Mercury were planning. In the toilet, in a hurried 
thing that tried to be flushed down the toilet was a, was a um, telephone page. The page had Sue's address and personal details. She was the innocent woman carjacked by McCurry after he fled Barclay Square with his shot-up hand. She'd seen McCurry and could identify him to police. That made her dangerous to both Cox and Santa McCurry. So you think that they were planning to get her? Correct. Um, Cox and McCurry were set to go and kill because she could identify Santo McCurry. Um, yeah, so obviously got moved and started new identity and, and things like that. So it was a fair bit out of the house <clears throat> that we got um, that later became vitally important when uh, we get all the information from Denning. So as the evidence mounted, they offered Cox the chance to confess. As always, he stayed staunch. By the time he was caught, things had changed for Cox. He'd fallen in love. On January the 3rd this year, police believe he was staying at the Mount Martha house on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. With Cox at the house was this woman, Helen Dean, sister-in-law to painter and docker Raymond... For a time, they were Australia's version of Bonnie and Clyde. His partner and love of his life was Helen Dean, a nurse's aide who patched him up when he was shot. After his Doncaster arrest, she turned up at court, perhaps hoping to spring him again. And interesting, when he fronted up uh, at the Melbourne Magistrates Court to be remanded, his de facto, Helen Dean, arrives just to see him. She was madly in love with him. So she's arrested because she was wanted at the, at the time as well. Interesting, she had a pen pistol in her handbag. Now that Cox was caught, he faced a pile of charges from Doncaster and Barclay Square, but there was another, more serious, historic charge. At the time of his arrest, he was wanted for the murder of fellow stick-up man Ian Revel Carroll. He's wanted for questioning about the murder in January of Melbourne painter and docker Ian Carroll. Because he knew he was wanted, of course, for the, the murder of Ian Revel Carroll down at Mount Martha in 1983. Now, um, Carroll was his um, arm robbery partner. Correct. And he became a big stick-up man. He was importing cars and mm. all the rest of it, had his kids in private school. Mm. But he had a shootout with um, Russell at Mount Martha. Correct. Over, over the, over the Christmas. Great robbery. Yeah. Like with most crooks, it was an argument over money. A lot of money. Money that came from the Great Bookie robbery. Proceeds of the Great Bookie robbery. Is that what it was over? That's what it was over. The Great Bookie robbery was stuff of legends. In 1976, a highly trained armed robbery crew raided the Victoria Club on Bookie's settling day. No one to this day knows exactly how much they got, but it was well north of $10 million. What sort of people pulled off this great bookies robbery? Mobsters? Almost certainly. When police searched the ceiling space at Mount Martha, it was like opening Pandora's box. That is, if Pandora was a career arm robber. Just back yeah. To, yeah. to Mount Martha, yep. in the ceiling were those strong boxes yep. with all the firepower and the weapons and the plans. Yep. And that's where, you know, they had all these arm robberies planned Correct. to be done. The, there was nothing short of an arsenal from yeah. uh, military-type weapons to handguns that were found in the ceiling. A cache of weapons was recovered from the house at the time. This was a Cox hallmark that would turn up time and again when police discovered his hideouts. Basically everything for an armed robbery starter kit. Russell was franchising armed robberies. But well after police cleared the crime scene at Mount Martha, Cox snuck back for a reason. The truck shed had been a, disturbed. A million bucks in a um, home, yeah. home brew tub. Correct. And when the police went back? It was gone. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't there. And it's certainly been, been disturbed, so somebody had gone back and, and had a good good look and got it. Yeah. yeah. And that, you reckon, was from the bookie robbery? Apparently so. That's the information that I have, yeah, which uh, is pretty sound. Mm. Yeah, so that's all. that dispute was over. After he was arrested, Cox faced enough charges never to be released. That would be if it was anyone other than Russell. And Russell Cox, um, you would think that he was going away forever because, of course, he's escaped from Katingle, so he's got that. Mm. He's got his original um, charge, conviction there, which I think was attempted murder. Mm. Um, he's got to jump over the murder of Ian Revel Carroll. Yeah, he was acquitted of that. Without proving who shot first, it could easily have been self-defence. Yeah. There was other stick-ups along the way and another, right. all of these things, but he beat all the charges. Yep. And then he turns up and, of course, he's got to be sentenced over uh, escaping from lawful custody from Katingle, 
and someone realises, you know what, the New South Wales government failed to ever gazette it as a prison. He is the luckiest crook walking around. Because it's, so it's not a prison, so he can't escape from it. Yeah. So he goes in to do his original time, mm. is a model prisoner, um, marries Helen Dean in prison, um, does a lot of courses, and when he goes for parole, some of the prison officers jump the box for him mm. and say he's totally reformed. Mm. Here's one of the prison officers who back Cox, explaining why. He's done what was required and uh, served his time and, uh, yeah, give him a chance. A vicious armed robber, Cox, in his heyday, was the country's most wanted criminal. Now the officials who released him are confident he can become a model citizen. He's fulfilled all the, uh, all the issues regarding his rehabilitation as far as we're concerned. He now goes into the community and we hope he succeeds. I tried to contact him. I would have loved to have interviewed him. And I reckon 60 minutes or people like that would have paid a big dollar for him. Absolutely. He grabbed Helen by the hand, walked out and disappeared. And as far as I know, he's... Uh, In Queensland, Bribe he, Island. Yeah, working away. Yep, still married. his own business. With, yeah, married to Helen Dean, yeah. That's where Russell Cox ended up. As far as anyone knows, he's still there. Sandra McCurry died of natural causes in custody, but the death of Denning remains a sinister mystery. Less than a month later, in April 93, he turns up dead in Sydney of an alleged heroin overdose. Um, and no one had ever known that he'd used heroin before. Uh, we strongly suspect that it was implicated that it was a hot shot. So you believe he was murdered? Absolutely. One last thing, the name Mad Dog. I've given a few crooks nicknames over the years and without doubt, Mad Dog Cox was the worst. He was anything but. In reality, he was calm, cool and ruthless. He really was Cox the Fox. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom. So to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This episode is produced and edited by Margaret Machine Gun Gordon and Anu the Axe Hasbold and mixed and mastered by Jellic Knight John Greenfield with technical assistance from Cool Hand Cormac Lally. Tom McHendrick is head of audio. Archival is thanks to 9 and 3AW. Special thanks to the full box for the audio of Chopper Reed from Tough Nuts. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Next episode is The Hero Above. David Key from the Police Air Wing. Did you think he wanted to die? Yes, basically. You know, just by looking at these these flames, and, oh, it's incredible because it was just roaring through.